of the Four Noble Truths. Number three, the cessation of suffering and stress, is the one that we talk about the least. The reason being that it's the result of the practice. You focus on the causes, the results take care of themselves. So most of our emphasis is on the path. But it's good to reflect on where the path is going, because it turns out the Third Noble Truth is not just nirvana. In fact, John Munn used to make the point very clearly, the Third Noble Truth is one thing, nirvana is something else. Because the Third Noble Truth is something that has a duty associated with it, which is to see it clearly. And when you compare this truth to the others, you notice that basically it's carrying out the duty with regard to the Second Noble Truth. The Second Noble Truth has the duty to be abandoned. You want to abandon sensual cravings, craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming. And the Third Noble Truth is just that, the act of really abandoning it once and for all. And it talks about six different ways, or six different stages, or six, six different aspects to abandoning. At a first glance, it simply looks like one list of six very close words. You can choose whichever one you want. The Buddha has this tendency sometimes he'll string out some adjectives or string out some verbs that are all pretty close in meaning to make sure if you don't get the first verb, well, you get the second. But as it turns out, in the case of these six aspects of abandoning. Three of them are mentioned in the steps for breath meditation, the very last three steps. Breathing in and out, sensitive to dispassion, breathing out, sensitive to cessation, breathing out, in and out, sensitive to relinquishing. So there's a practical aspect to this, and there are certain subtle differences among the different ways of looking at abandoning. And you can take it as a guide. <coughs> the six types of abandoning are Riraga, Niroto, Jago, Bhati, Nisigo, Muti, and Aliyo. Riraga, dispassion. The texts talk about two different ways that you're trying to develop dispassion for craving. <coughs> you notice that it's we're passionate for our craving. We may crave things, but we like our craving even more than we like things. We crave sensual pleasures, but we really feed off the sensual craving. And so we first have to learn how not to feed off it. In a lot of the texts, Wiraga, dispassion, comes right after disenchantment. In other words, you try to practice in a way so that you see that the things you've been feeding on just don't really satisfy you that much. They're not worth the effort. And one of the ways the Buddha has you develop disenchantment is through focusing on the inconstancy of what you've been feeding on. But it's not enough just to say, so oh, it rises and it passes away, or it rises because of causes and passes away because of causes. Well, what's next? He actually wants you to look at it coming and going. This is why the emphasis on the Third Noble Truth is, or the duty with regard to the Third Noble Truth is, realizing it while it's happening. Because we let go of our cravings throughout the day, but usually it's because we're interested in something else. We lose interest in one thing because we're suddenly fascinated by something else. And so we don't really look carefully at the process, what's involved in letting go. Well, basically what it comes down to is you find something else that you think is more worth your interest, more worth, worth your effort i.e., it's worth the effort that goes into it, and suddenly you see the old craving as not quite that interesting, not quite that rewarding, you let it go. What are the stages? Well, you see it come and you see it go. If you want to do this really consciously, then when you see it coming and going, you want to see what's coming and going along with it. And when you see what the craving comes, okay, there's going to be stress and suffering. You want to see that connection directly. And when the craving goes, the stress and suffering goes. You want to see that directly as well. And then you think about the rewards and the drawbacks. 
Now, some things that come and go are actually things you want to develop. You want to develop a path. But a lot of other things that we crave and that come and go are not worth the effort. And you want to see that okay, the amount of effort that goes into it and the amount of pleasure that comes in from it doesn't really measure up to all the suffering that it causes, both immediately and in the long term. That's when you want to start looking for the escape, which is dispassion. So pa dispassion is something that you're trying to develop by weighing things. See what's worth your effort, what's not. What's really rewarding and what's actually painful has drawbacks, has disadvantages. But very simply, the price is not worth the object you get or the pleasure you get out of it. All our sensual pleasures carry a price. We tend to turn a blind eye to it, which is why the Buddha wants us to look very carefully at that. What is the price of your lust? What is the price of your greed? What is the price of your irritation over things that you don't get, or that when you get them are not satisfied? You want to weigh things carefully. That's how you develop disenchantment. From disenchantment comes uraga or dispassion. We begin to see that the craving is something that we're manufacturing all the time. And as long as there's passion for it, you keep producing it. It's like a factory that's run off of passion. When the passion goes, then it doesn't come anymore. We tend to think the craving is something that's there that we feed on, but we have to create it first to feed off it. When there's no, dis when there's no passion for it, it stops. We stop putting effort into it. That's why dispassion, when the Buddha is talking about the contemplations of breath meditation, is followed by contemplation of cessation, that when you don't have passion for these things, they stop on their own. Now, there may be a little bit of momentum that runs out from some of your past passion, but your present passion is not giving any more power to them. And they run out, run out, run out. The next two steps are jango, bhatini, sagon, giving back, relinquishing. You realize that you've been holding on to things that weren't really yours to begin with, and so you give them back. And John Lee has a nice image. He says, you spit things out. You swallow it, you got it in your mouth, but you're ready to swallow and you realize, I don't want this. So you spit it out. It's followed by muti. You release it. This is one of the more interesting descriptions of abandoning. You give freedom to the craving. You've been hanging on to it. You've been trying to milk it for what you want. It's like an animal that you've been milking, and you suddenly realize, okay, I don't need this anymore. You let it go. You give it its freedom. And when you give it its freedom, that's when you're free. The common image in the canon is a fire. The fire is trapped by its fuel, fuel. But why is it trapped by its fuel? Because it's holding on. The fuel isn't trapping the fire. The fire is the one that's feeding, feeding, feeding off the fuel. And as a result of its feeding, it's trapped. So when you see that you're feeding and you don't want to feed anymore, you let go. And both sides get their freedom. The Johns talk about this quite a lot. The things that you've been holding on to, things you've turned into defilement, are suddenly released and they're no longer touched by defilement in any way at all. And John Mahabhava's analogy is of stolen goods. Got a thief, stolen some stuff, and then the stolen goods become evidence in the trial. And the stolen goods have to be kept by the court. But then once they figure out okay, who they really belong to, okay, then the stolen goods are free. They can go back to where they were before. We are the ones that have deludedly gotten into these things and held on to them.
then they're not holding on to us. And John Lee's image is a plate of rice. If you don't eat the rice, the rice doesn't cry. You're the one who cries. And think about your own body. Most of us think that we have a pact with our body. We take care of it, it seems happy, it'll take care of us. The body has nothing at all that it wants out of us. It would be perfectly content to die, do whatever, whatever its material elements want to do, or just do by their nature whether they want to or not. But we're the ones who have entered in and placed all sorts of conditions on them. This is going to be that way, that's going to be this way. And we can make the body do that up to some extent, but after a while it's going to go only so far. And we are the ones who feel betrayed. We're not betrayed by the body, we've been betrayed by our own craving. So when you let that go, when you stop producing it, both sides get freed. And finally, analio, which in the Thai sense of the term means that you have nostalgia for it, you don't miss it. This is our big problem. Usually when we let go of a craving, part of us still misses it and we're ready to pick it up the next time around. In the current equation, you've let go of that craving because you found something better. Well, maybe something better doesn't work out. So you go back to the old one. We still feel nostalgia. So if you find that you've let go of something because you felt you should, and there's still some nostalgia for it, okay, that's what you've got to look into. What's the nostalgia? Because that's the seed for the next bout of craving again. So only when you're totally free of any nostalgia for these things, you've had enough and you never want to go back there, and you've let go to the point where there is a freedom that allows you not to go back. It's only then that the, the dispassion and the rest of these things are without remainder, a sesa, as they say in the Pali. Up till that point, there's still going to be a little trace left over. It's that little bit of nostalgia. So that's what you've got to watch out for. Many times you can let go, let go, let go. But as one of the John Lee students once said, you let go, but your hand is still on top of it ready to grab it. So if you see that you've got that tendency, that you've let go but something still wants to go back, you've really got to look into that. What is it that you still haven't fully understood about the drawbacks of that kind of craving? So these are some of the lessons that come from looking at that string of words, viraga, niroto. Jago Patinisigo Mutinalio. To give us a sense of what it means to really abandon things. The word the Buddha keeps focusing in on there though is the, the freeing. Because once you free the craving, then you get freed as well. Freedom comes from letting go, giving back. So you want to learn how to appreciate that freedom, even in little glimpses you should get when you let go of one craving, even if it's not total yet, but begin to see, oh, there's a little bit of freedom in there. Try to widen that freedom by being really hard on whatever nostalgia you might feel for the old craving, because that's how you get rid of those last traces.